Welcome uh, to the Minnesota Senate Commerce and Consumer Protection P Committee, March 14th, 2024. Uh, call the meeting to order. Senator Port, Senate File 3537 is in front of the committee. Senator Thank Port. you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, I'll do a brief intro here and then I have a couple of amendments to get my bill in order. That's fine. Um, good afternoon, members. Uh, think about the last time that you bought an airline ticket, a hotel room, tickets to a concert or show, or a new phone. Was the price that you saw next to the item even close to the price that you ended up paying? Think about the last time you went out to dinner or ordered food online. How many different fees were added to your order? Corporations in Minnesota are employing underhanded tactics to hike prices on families already struggling to meet expenses. On average, Minnesota households spend over $3,000 annually on junk fees that artificially inflate prices without offering any tangible benefits. In a survey by North Star Prosperity, 85% of Minnesotans encountered these fees and they're often hidden at the last web page before you check out or on the bottom of your receipt after you've eaten your meal, making them difficult to avoid and skewing the, the ability to comparison shop. I'm proud to be the author of Senate File 3537, which requires disclosure of all fees and charges on the advertised and displayed price of any good or service. This bill would provide consumers with clear, upfront understanding of a product's total cost and discourage the use of hidden fees to undercut honest small businesses and exploit hardworking Minnesota families. Junk fees reward companies that deceive consumers, disguise the true cost of a good or service, and put honest businesses at a disadvantage. These hidden fees rip off consumers to pad the bottom line for corporate profits. Minnesotans deserve transparency in pricing. I do wanna thank all the stakeholders who have worked with me over the past weeks to make sure that this bill does what it intends to and doesn't have unintended consequences. I look forward to continuing to work with stakeholders through the process as we move this bill forward. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I do have um, an A2 author's amendment. Senator Port offers the A2 as an author's amendment. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. The bill is in the shape that you would like. Senator Port, would you like us to go to other amendments? Yes, uh, I have the A7. Senator. Mr. Chair, I would like to offer the A7 amendment. Senator Frentz offers the A7 amendment to Senate File 3537 to the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is just a, a wording amendment change, uh, technical in nature to change consumer to person, uh, to remove food and menu to make them uh, more general terms. Uh, that's all this amendment does. Member questions or comments on the A7? Seeing none, all in favor of the A7 and say aye. Aye. Opposed? Amendment is adopted. Senator Frentz? Um, Senator Port, I believe we also have the A2 and A, do we adopt the A5, Mr. Chair? We I have did. the A2 and the A5, Mr. Chair, and would like to offer them when appropriate. I think oh. the A8 is what I would like to offer. Senator Frentz offers the A8 amendment uh, to the amendment, Senator Port. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is to clarify that um, for food service establishments that are moving away from gratuity and if they want to have a flat rate added in, in space of gratuity, that they can do that as long as it is disclosed. Um, and this lays out that practice. Any questions or comments on the A2? I'm sorry, the A8 amendment. Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? A8 is adopted. What we maybe want to do now is go to testifiers before we go to member questions and comments. Um, we have a several, and we'll bring you up two at a time. Uh, Mr. Azad Nade and Mr. Mike Dean, please come to the table. Mr. Nade, please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Chair Klein, members of the committee, my name is Azan Duk. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share my story today. I'm a first generation American from St. Michael, Minnesota. My parents immigrated from Cameroon in search of a better life for themselves and our family. You could say that our family business is medicine, as my father is a nurse, my mother's background is in public health, 
and I work as a nursing assistant while attending community college full time. I live in a multi-generational household with 11 mouths to feed. Every penny earned supports not only our family here in Minnesota, but our family back home in Cameroon. Like many first-generation college students, I have to pay for my college on my own. This means meticulously tracking every penny earned and making sure that I have sufficient funds in my checking account. And sometimes this means that I have to transfer money from my savings into my checking. And just recently, I realized that each time I did this, my bank was charging me $7. And the, these charges really added up. And I saw the $28 bill, which I do realize for many, it may not be a lot of money, but on my budget, it can really go a long way. That's part of what makes junk fees so abhorrent. Corporate profits and CEO salaries are an all-time high, but Minnesota families are struggling. Is it fair that my bank gets to charge me for moving my own hard-earned money? Why does my bank get to do this? Should so some rich CEO get to profit off of the back of a community college student? Chair Klein, members of the committee, Minnesota families need you. Community college students need you. Please support SF 3537 and put an end to these junk fees. Thank you, Ms. Day. And as you clear the table, can Mr. Matt Kelleher please come to the table? Mr. Mike Dean, please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Yeah. Chair Klein, members of the committee, my name is Mike Dean. I'm the Executive Director of North Star Prosperity. Uh, first, I want to start off by thanking Senator Port for her leadership on this issue. She's done a phenomenal job over the last few months here listening to countless stakeholders and really trying to weigh their interests and concerns. But she's done a great job of always centering these issues around the consumers and what's best interest for them. Uh, I'm here today to talk about how corporate profits and CEO salaries are at an all-time high, while prices for everyday goods and services are skyrocketing. It's time to give Minnesotans a break. Junk fees are the newest way that wealthy corporations are reaching to the pockets of Minnesota hardworking families. These fees only benefit the bottom line of these greedy corporations that charge them, while consumers and local businesses find themselves at a competitive disadvantage. Minnesotans are fed up with these fees. Just this past weekend, I stood in line for hours at the Women's Big Ten Basketball Tournament alongside my daughter and her friends. What was struck what I, was struck, what I was struck with is the unanimous frustration uh, around junk fees for Hawkeye fans, Buckeyes, Gophers, and Ebert Badger fans. Um, I listened to countless tales about how these junk fees are literally in every part of our lives, from phone bills to credit cards to tickets to rent and tuition payments. Uh, over the course of the weekend, it became evident that the disdain that Big Ten fans hold towards junk fees is only matched by your disdain for the SEC. Public opinion polling shows that Minnesotans overwhelmingly oppose the use of junk fees. A poll conducted by the American Liberties uh, Project found that 85% of Minnesotan voters support legislation making junk fees illegal. Support for this legislation is incredibly intense, with two-thirds of Minnesota voters reporting strong support uh, for uh, opposing junk fees. Hundreds of Minnesotans have actually submitted comments to the Federal Trade Commission on this practice. I just want to share a few of their stories. Sarah from Minnetonka talked about, and I quote, I'm a full-time working mother with three children. Plenty for all life's expenses is difficult when costs are not clearly transparent for budgeting for a family, life, family of five. Tickets to events, mobile phone bills, and airline fees are all examples. I see often where added fees are tacked on to the final amount. And then Deborah from Egan said, I'm being charged $4.35 monthly for the landlord to assess my utility bill. Is it, is it just for the company that services that holding company uh, that owns the building? The only reason I'm being charged is to pay the LLC for using the service that they require. The Minnesota legislature has an important choice to listen to the powerful industry trade groups that are taking advantage of Minnesotans or listening to the people of Minnesota who are demanding full disclosure of these fees and charges, ensuring that the advertised price reflects the true costs of the product or service. I urge you to stand for Minnesotans and support Senate File 3537. Thank you, Mr. Dean. And as you clear the table, Mr. Bad Eidelkoch, please come forward. Mr. Kelleher, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and proceed with your testimony. Thank you. Chair Klein, members of the committee, my name is Matt Kelleher. I am a St. Paul uh, resident and a state and local policy specialist at the American Economic Liberties Project, a research and advocacy organization dedicated to reducing the power corporations wield over our economy and our democracy. I am here today to voice my strong support for SF 3537, Senator Port's bill to, uh, to ban junk fees in Minnesota. Hidden and deceptive fees have become pervasive in a variety of industries. We've all seen them on live event tickets, I know I've paid my, my fair share of them uh, to see the Timberwolves play. But they're also levied on hotel reservations, cable and phone bills, rental housing, storage units, food delivery services, and more. 
These fees are tacked on uh, near the end of transactions without consumers' prior knowledge nor consent, drastically altering the final price of a product or service from the price that was initially advertised. Research has shown that junk fees raise prices by as much as 20% and cost the average American family uh, more than $3,000 per year. Last week at the State of the Union, the President stated that his administration is eliminating billions in junk fees. And state legislators have a vital role to play to support that work and to ensure that Minnesotans can enforce rules against junk fees within our own state. By passing this legislation, you guarantee that Minnesotans have access to transparent pricing, allowing them to make informed decisions about their purchases through honest comparison shopping. Moreover, it sends a clear message to corporations that these deceptive pricing practices will not be tolerated in Minnesota. All-in pricing promotes healthy competition among businesses. Local businesses with transparent pricing shouldn't be harmed by appearing artificially more expensive than big corporations that rely on hidden fees. To be clear, this legislation only covers mandatory fees that consumers cannot avoid. It does not tell businesses what price they can charge, and it does not prevent the use of optional add-ons that consumers affirmatively choose. It simply says that if a fee must be paid in order to complete the transaction, that fee must be disclosed up front so consumers know the actual price they are agreeing to pay. The public overwhelmingly supports this legislation. 86% of Minnesotans support it, including 93% of Democrats, 87% of Independents, and 78% of Republicans. So I urge you to, uh, to vote in favor of Senator Port's bill to ban junk fees, and thank you for considering my testimony today. Thank you, Mr. Kelleher. And as you uh, clear the table, can Mr. Andy, Andy Plato come forward? Mr. Eidelko, please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Uh, my name is Eric Linseth. I'm the general counsel at Lifetime. I'm pinch hitting for my colleague, Brad Eidelkope, today. Um, at Lifetime, uh, we own large health and fitness clubs throughout the United States. We have 24 of them in the United or in uh, Minnesota, with about 200,000 members. Uh, we've been very pro-consumer from the very beginning of our company. We've always used uh, short-term, month-to-month, continuous service contracts. Uh, we're very transparent with respect to the fees that we charge. Uh, so, from a from a principled standpoint, we don't oppose this legislation. The concern that I have is that, at least at Lifetime and I think other businesses, often uh, a consumer will build a membership. They will identify whether they want a standard membership or a signature membership, which at Lifetime would give access to small group training. They would identify whether they have a, want a single couple or family membership. And then they would identify a payment type, and that payment type uh, may have a surcharge associated with it if it's a credit card, because that's been lawful uh, throughout most of the United States for a long period of time, and many merchants charge it. And so all I wanted to suggest to the committee is that you might not know what a mandatory fee is uh, until you actually get through the process of building a membership. I think it's absolutely fair for all of uh, all fees to be, char to, to be disclosed prior to the time that a consumer contracts, and obviously we do that because that's a material term. But it is sometimes challenging to figure out what the mandatory fees are until a consumer gets all the way through and elects a particular payment type. So I would just ask uh, if the author is willing to continue discussions, um, certainly we would be open to that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And as you clear the table, can Ms. Jill Sims come forward? Mr. Plato, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Andy Plato, and I'm testifying today on behalf of the MSP Small Business Concessions Alliance, or the MSBCA. MSBCA members are the women and minority small business owners and operators who are federally certified as airport concessions disadvantaged business enterprises at MSP Airport. Under our leases, the Metropolitan Airports Commission, our landlord, regulates many phases of our businesses, including the prices we can charge our customers. To align with prices on the street, or the average price of an item at a comparable non-airport business, the MAC has granted concessionaires the ability to charge a 4.5% hospitality fee on top of list prices. But the MAC also restricts what we can charge using the standard of street price plus 10%. 
This differential from non-airport competitors is an important recognition of the higher costs of building and operating at airport locations. If enacted as currently drafted, Senate File 3537 would require our members to combine the 4.5% hospitality fee to the stated or advertised price. If they were to do that, the listed price would often exceed the street plus 10 standard. Therefore, the unique pricing structure at MSP would leave us with only one option to comply with both our leases and the potential new law, lowering our prices. We believe we are the only businesses in the state with this specific issue and hope to continue working with the bill's author and her staff to avoid this unintended consequence. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Plato. And as you clear the table, can Ms. Beth Cadoon please come forward? Ms. Sims, please introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, members. My name is Jill Sims, and I am the Director of Government Relations at Hospitality Minnesota. We appreciate the opportunity to weigh in on Senate File 3537. First and foremost, thank you, Senator Port, uh, for your willingness to continually meet with us and work with us um, to understand the impacts of the bill. Additionally, thank you, Senator Friends and Senator Port, for the A8 Amendment. Hospitality encompasses a variety of business models, many of which will be impacted by this bill. As this legislation moves forward, we ask that there is greater clarity as to who and what is impacted by the bill. Since there is simultaneous movement on junk fees through the Federal Trade Commission, uh, it is important that our industry fully understands their options and has time to implement any changes. Currently in Minnesota, there are options for hospitality businesses to impose certain fees as long as they are properly disclosed on menus and receipts. While not all businesses choose to utilize these fees, it's an important tool for some of our businesses. For perspective, restaurant operators have been using fees and surcharges related to diners added value or added services for decades. Diners have come to expect them in many experiences like large groups, delivery, and when using a credit card. Providing guidance and implementation time to Minnesota restaurants should their current models change is imperative. For our hotel industry, we support a federal standard that ensure, ensures a fair competitive playing field. Our own Senator Amy Klobuchar has introduced the No Hidden Fees Act, which mandates all in-pricing display for anyone offering rates for short-term lodging. We believe trice, tri, ugh, trice, oh my God, price transparency is important for all lodging bookings and hope to see parity across platforms like hotel websites, online travel agencies, meta search sites, and short-term rentals. Finally, we look forward to continuing to work with the authors around language, uh, ensuring that quasi-government fees like tourism improvement districts or the retail delivery fee are exempted from this legislation. We'd also like to ask for a one-year delay for implementation so our businesses can be prepared. Um, thank you, Senator Port, for your willingness to continue to work with us. Thank you, Ms. Sims. And as you clear the table, can Ms. Judy Cook please come forward? Uh, Ms. Kadoon, please introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Beth Kadoon. I represent the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. The Minnesota Chamber does support price transparency and understands consumers' frustration with surprise fees. And we also thank Senator Report for her willingness to work with industries on these. However, we do remain concerned and opposed to the bill at this time due to the overbroad nature of the proposal, potential conflicts with federal law, and we believe adding unnecessary litigation risk and cost due to the lack of clarity in this bill language. This is an overbroad solution as impacting all industries, regardless if there are pricing concerns in that industry or not. Other states that are looking at this issue are taking a more, um, we believe, targeted approach for specific industries when they're hearing concerns from consumers. And you have already seen a bill that's targeted at a specific industry in Senate File 2003 on ticket sales. There is also, as been mentioned, a new federal trade regulation being promulgated at this time by the Federal Trade Commission on this very same subject. The FTC commenced rulemaking on, in November on a rule to prohibit unfair or deceptive practices relating to fees for goods or services. The comment period closed February 7th, and we expect they will be finalizing their rule in the next few months. The FTC does have differing language and provides more guidance on what those terms mean when you talk about a total price. Minnesota's bill uses a reasonable person standard, which means those terms would need to be litigated to actually determine what those standards are. 
The FTC has also stated that they're looking to exempt certain industries that are already covered in other laws. And as has been mentioned by others, the language provided in the bill does not necessarily provide clarity for industries that already have extensive pricing laws. We recommend waiting on this bill until the FTC rule is finalized in order to minimize conflicts, confusion, and unnecessary litigation in Minnesota. We recommend if this bill does move forward to clearly exempt industries that are already covered in other pricing laws and also to add fees to that A2 amendment, which I believe is adopted, on line 1.2 that exempts government imposed taxes but doesn't exempt government imposed fees. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kadoon. And as you clear the table, can Mr. Todd Hill please come forward? Ms. Cook, please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Judy Cook with Cook Strong Selwood, and I am testifying today on behalf of TechNet, the national bipartisan network that promotes the growth of the innovation economy. I want to thank Senator Port as well for considering suggested language we provided, and we appreciate the inclusion of language that would address some of our concerns. We also acknowledge there are changes in the amendment that we believe may be attempts to address issues we raised but aren't quite there yet. Uh, and so TechNet remains opposed to uh, the bill at this time. TechNet agrees that consumers should have transparency on prices. They pay for goods and services. And um, I'd like to differ that this is a junk fee bill, as it's been called, because it covers all products and all services in the marketplace, including fees and charges that are legitimate and appropriate. In the past, providing price transparency may have been simpler, but with the proliferation of online sales and platforms in the marketplace, it is much more complex. It is very important that any law provide clear guidance to businesses on how to comply, and that the language recognizes different business models and ways consumers make purchases today. This is even more important because the language will be in the Deceptive Trade Practices Statute, where, as I understand it, the bar for bringing a lawsuit is lower. It does not require a demonstration of harm, but just that a violation of the law has occurred. Yet the harm is significant for businesses who face allegations of deceptive trade practices. This is not limited to willful uh, actions to deceive. Lawsuits could be brought in one, even in cases of honest mistakes. Further, it is important to have consistency among state laws to ensure compliance and consumer understanding. I encourage you to read TechNet's letter in your packet that outlines concerns, including impact on the gig economy, where frequently the product or service being purchased has components that are variable. For example, on product delivery, the cost of the product remains the same, but the delivery charge can vary based on how quickly I want it, total order amount, distance, maybe a membership. It is not possible to include this in the price. We do not disagree with the intent to have information listing fees that will be incurred, but the language currently doesn't allow for that variability. And so I'd like to identify some specific language concerns and offer some suggestions. And I'm pretty sure I have my page in line right on the DE. On line 1.11, the word include would suggest that the price of a product should include all service charges and fees, which may not be possible to know. Instead, we suggest the language disclose all known and calculable, calculable so it's clear how information must be posted for the consumer. On line 1.17, the language not reasonably avoidable, and on line 1.18, the language a reasonable consumer would expect. Do not provide enough clarity to avoid the possibility of lawsuits, as this language is open to interpretation. On line 1.20 and 1.21, we believe, as others have stated, this should include government-imposed fees as well as taxes. On line 2.9, there are many industries who have state or federal laws and regulations regarding pricing, and this language appears to require a preemption, something that is not frequently included in those laws. For example, we represent the Minnesota Funeral Directors Association, and there are state and federal laws that regulate funeral pricing that would not be consistent with this bill. We would suggest adding a clear exemption for businesses who already have price regulation requirements so businesses do not face conflicting laws. Again, we do not conceptually oppose a law on price transparency, and we believe a law can be both clear and understandable for businesses and provide Minnesota consumers with the information they need to make purchasing decisions. 
We look forward to our continued discussions with the author. Thank you so much, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Cook. And as you clear, could Mr. Scott Lambert please come forward? Mr. Hill, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. For the record, my name is Todd Hill with Hill Capital Strategies, and I'm here on behalf of my client, uh, Enterprise Rent-A-Car. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to just give some brief remarks, and I want to thank Senator Port for also meeting with us and listening to our concerns. I'll be very brief because my concern has been raised by a couple of other testifiers. Our big issue as a rental car company, we try our best to do, have great price transparency, but the issue we have is we have a number of mandated taxes and fees that we have to collect when you rent a car. For example, at the airport, there are five different taxes that we collect and a $5.90 per day auto charge. Those are all mandated at the airport. When you rent a car, you pay nearly 34% in additional taxes and fees that are not hidden. They're not going to the company, but they go to some unit of government that wishes to collect them. What we would ask for is on line 1.20, where we talk about what a mandatory, or uh, we change what the definition, or define the definition for a mandatory fee to not include taxes. We would just simply ask that you would include, uh, change that to say it does not include taxes or fees mandated by a government entity, and that would take care of our concerns. We would also ask perhaps that there would be some delay in the implementation of this. I think as the bill is drafted today, it would go into effect on August 1st. This is going to take some substantial time for companies to do the programming necessary to implement the law. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hill. And could Ms. Sarah Pasek please come forward? Uh, Mr. Lambert, please introduce yourself and proceed. Mr. Chairman, thank you. My name is Scott Lambert, and I'm president of the Minnesota Automobile Dealers Association. Mr. Chairman, while I think I understand the uh, intent of Senate File 3537, we have a lot of concerns about this bill and the impact on our industry. Uh, first of all, let me be clear that there are no secret fees attached to the purchase of a motor vehicle. Everything is disclosed during the course of the sale. But a vehicle purchase, on average, is $48,000 and is not a simple, quick, or impulse item. Important items are disclosed when it's timely to do so. Not including sales, registration, and wheelage taxes, there are 10 to 13 different fees attached to the sale of a motor vehicle, and the cost can range from $290 to $545. It varies based on what type of plate you get, if it's personalized, and if there's a contribution attached to it. And if you're purchase, purchasing an electric vehicle, there's a $75 surcharge, which by our reading would still have to be disclosed in the advertised price. Unlike many of the fees discussed by the author, all of these fees are authorized in Minnesota statute. By including, excuse me, by including these fees and surcharges in the advertised price, this bill creates a troubling problem for us, since approximately 20% of our sales are estimated to be from customers living in other states, we would become uncompetitive overnight with those dealers in other regions. Likewise, Minnesota consumers will be traveling to neighboring states in the mistaken belief that vehicle prices are lower in Wisconsin or Iowa or other Midwestern states that do not have to disclose their fees in their advertising. It would not be an apples to apples comparison. And Mr. Chairman, you would be surprised at how far people travel to save uh, a few bucks on a vehicle purchase. Uh, finally, I'm especially concerned about the third standard uh, as it prohibits a mandatory fee that a reasonable consumer would expect to be included in the purchase of the goods or services being advertised. I'm not entirely certain what that means, and I'm not sure what guidance we would give our, our dealers to ensure that they didn't trip over it. Uh, because this is going into the deceptive trade practices statute, the bill creates a huge potential right of civil action. Uh, at least for our industry, Mr. Chairman, I believe this legislation has the potential to create uh, uh, confusion and potentially do more harm than good. I would like to be able to work with the authors some more on our concerns, and I appreciate the committee's listening to me today. Thank you, Mr. Lambert. Ms. Pasek, please introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and members of the committee and Senator Port. My name is Sarah Pasek. I'm with the CTIA, the Trade Association for the Wireless Industry. I want to thank Senator Port for previously meeting with us. However, the amendment adopted does not fully address our concerns, so I'm speaking in opposition to the bill. We appreciate the goal of protecting consumers from practices that may undermine their ability to make informed purchasing decisions, and our industry is committed to ensuring consumers have accurate and transparent information. However, robust federal regulations and public industry commitments already exist. 
The wireless industry is regulated by the FCC, which has its own regulatory regime to protect consumers from surprise or unfair fees and billing practices, including the broadband consumer labeling and truth and billing regulations. The FCC's rules already re require the wireless industry con to convey relevant information to consumers to effectively prevent and hold wireless pr providers responsible for any unfair or deceptive fees. The FCC's broadband labeling requirements lay out key information about prices, including monthly and one-time fees, the availability of discounts and bundles, the amount of data included in the base price, typical upload and download speed, and a provider's network management and privacy policies. The FCC's truth and billing requirements, which are broad binding principles that ensure wireless voice providers offer information on customers' bills that is clear and not misleading. Importantly, in directing in adopting this directive, Congress clearly intended the FCC to reg regulate advertising of broadband on a national level. A state-specific approach to regulating our industry could create additional consumer confusion with the potential for different pricing requirements in different states, especially since advertising happens across state lines. We want to avoid a patchwork of state-by-state -state regulations for services that are offered and regulated on a nationwide basis. So CTIA respectfully requests that if the committee decides to move forward with this bill, we ask that you limit it to specific industries that don't face the same robust federal oversight, and this has been done in Pennsylvania and Connecticut. So thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you, Ms. Pasek. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you to the, the bill author for this conversation today. And as a consumer, I, I get very annoyed with junk fees and not knowing the, the total cost as a consumer that I'm going to pay for a product. And I think it uh, concerns a lot of Minnesotans. And I appreciate the conversation here today. Um, Mr. Chair, I do have a couple of amendments, if it would be appropriate, to offer at this time. Um, Mr. Chair, I would like to move the A5, and I'm happy to describe the amendment. Senator Rasmussen moves the A5. Members, it should be in your packets. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And this amendment is to address some of the concerns we've heard today about highly regulated industries. Uh, this would uh, explicitly exempt uh, businesses that are regulated by the Minnesota Public Utilities Commission, such as electric utilities, um, or the Federal Communications Commission. Uh, both of these entities have oversight over pricing and I uh, just want to make sure that uh, the, the bill before the committee wouldn't conflict with uh, any pricing regulations coming from those bodies. Senator Port. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Rasmussen. I, I appreciate you bringing this to me. I think this is um, some of the language we've been looking for. Uh, much of the language that has been proposed to us by stakeholders cites specific code numbers or statute numbers in federal law. And we have concerns about putting that level of specificity in it, because if it changes at the federal level, then suddenly you're at, you're, you have a huge loophole or an unregulated industry um, or an industry that is now subject to these regulations. And so um, I am happy to take this as a friendly amendment. I think it threads that needle, uh, and I think it's a good fix for the bill. Member comments or questions on the A5? There are none. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? The A5 is adopted. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I appreciate the bill author's uh, consideration of these amendments, and um, I have one more that I would like to offer. And so at this time, Mr. Chair, I would move the A6, and I'm happy to describe. Senator Rasmussen moves the A6 amendment to your amendment. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and to the bill author's comment, I, I agree that it's oftentimes not the best to have direct citations to federal code regulations that could be a moving target. And so the A6 amendment is designed to address and make sure that this bill doesn't apply to industries where either federal or state law regulates pricing disclosures. If we already have a structure in state law, federal law that says how these companies must regulate uh, their pricing disclosures, we don't want to create a conflict with this bill. Uh, so similar to the A5, uh, just trying to um, address some of those concerns. Senator Rest, uh, sorry, Senator uh, Port. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I also consider this a friendly amendment. We have a line um, close to this that talks about federal law in the bill, but I think the addition of state law is a good one, and I consider this to be friendly. Other member questions or comments? 
All in favor of the A6 say aye. 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 Opposed? A6 is adopted. Other member questions, comments, or amendments? Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Before um, any comments, I would like to offer an oral amendment, if you will indulge me. Proceed. Uh, thank you. On line 1.20, after the word taxes, I would like to insert the words or fees. Just give me a second here. I'm trying to pull up the delete everything. Can you state the oral amendment again, please? Uh, no problem, Mr. Chair. Line 1.20, after the word taxes, I would like to insert the words or fees. Can the council report the amendment? This will amend uh, SF 3537A2, page one, line two zero, after the word taxes, insert or fees. Senator Port. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Duckworth. Um, I am gonna ask for a no vote on this today and uh, I'll explain why. We are working with tax council uh, currently and that's part of the reason why we're laying this bill over uh, to figure out what the correct wording is in, that's, in that instance. We are trying to capture mandatory taxes and fees, but do you consider minimum wage to be a mandatory fee? Um, things like that that are sort of opaque um, we are working with tax council to get the right definition of the word to make sure that what we are encompassing is what we mean to encompass, but not, you know, every single thing that the gov that the government mandates uh, is not a tax or a fee necessarily. Um, so we are working with tax council, and I would prefer to wait until we have their expertise on this. Sir Duckworth, no, thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate it, uh, and I appreciate that sentiment. Uh, I'd love to see a version of your bill that relates specifically to uh, government taxes and fees in general. Um, I'm being a little bit facetious, but I understand what you're saying, and I think we heard from testifiers they have concerns about it. It sounds like you admit there is some ambiguity there that does need to be cleared up. So in the interest of saving time, Mr. Chair, I will withdraw that amendment, uh, but I, I, I would love to see some additional clarity there for peace of mind for folks, and so I, I appreciate to hear that you're still working on that. If I may continue, Mr. Chair. Senator uh, Duckworth withdraws his oral amendment. Senator Duckworth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, some of my concerns were alleviated by the amendment that was recently added, uh, presented by Senator Rasmussen as it relates to things that are already sort of governed uh, by federal regulation or state law, specifically the real estate industry. There's a whole host of disclosures that have to take place, and uh, I think it's important that we know that hopefully satisfies the intent of, of your bill and disclosure to consumers. One quick question I have before some additional comments would be, um, you know, would the typical disclaimers that have sort of been adopted in all the various industries over the years sort of satisfy the intent of your bill? Or is this something that's trying to go above and beyond what is sort of a commonplace disclosure that might exist in a, an advertisement or a commercial, for example, such as, you know, uh, various taxes or, or fees, you know, may apply? Does this go well, well beyond that? Or does that kind of still satisfy the level of disclosure that you're looking for? Senator Port. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Duckworth. I think it really depends on the industry or the product. If what you're saying is, you know, taxes and fees will apply, but you don't say when or how much or what they're related to, and then you get to the end, potentially, of your meal or the end page to check out, and suddenly your price is twice as expensive, and there's no disclosure of, is that taxes? Is that because there's a delivery charge? Is that because there's postage? All of these things are laid out in the bill. Or is it just a service fee that you have no idea what it's for or what it um, you know, is spent on? That is a sort of, dis um, like sort of surprise cost that we are trying to avoid. Um, lots of industries do this very well already. Um, they put up front, you know, it's gonna cost, you're gonna have postage on this, you're gonna, based on weight, uh, you know, if you're buying a 400 pound table versus a end table, that's variable for sure, but it's based on something that the customer understands. And I think what we're trying to get at here is fees that come out of nowhere and don't have a tangible line you can draw between the cost and why it's there. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for that. Um, 
when we when we look at the intent of your bill, would a good faith estimate or an approximation provided by the person, business, or entity advertising something for sale meet the threshold of disclosure that you're looking for, or is that not something that would be uh, acceptable under the the terms of this bill? Senator Port. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Duckworth. There are several areas where it says uh, you know you can charge um, for postage based on the actual cost of postage. You might not be able to have the exact cost there, um, and that is a place we want there to be at least in the ballpark room, and I think that is language we're continuing to fine tune there. Um, a lot of other places that we've talked to originally sort of have that question and then aren't able to really provide an example of when they wouldn't be able to know the price. Um, because if they're allowed to do this, and then just the next page on the website would have what you would be charged, they, they know what the price is. Um, and so it, it's not actually a thing that we've been able to pin down on when that would be a concern. Sure, Senator Duck. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I, I can appreciate that. Now I'll maybe give a couple of examples. And I think a lot of it has to do with the timeline of a purchase sometimes. Oftentimes when we're thinking about this, we're thinking about a same day purchase, I'm getting my good or service right then or there. Uh, but there could be a, the instance in which you are purchasing something to be built. Uh, let's say you are fortunate enough to be able to purchase a brand new vehicle. Well, if you go to uh, Ford's website right now or to their dealership and you say you want a, a brand new hybrid Ford Maverick, they're gonna tell you, good luck. Uh, we'll get it to you when we can. They're also gonna tell you, we can't tell you exactly what that cost might be today. Uh, we can give you some estimates, we can do an invoice, but it's gonna be subject to some changes that might occur depending upon when we're actually able to build or construct that vehicle for you. Uh, I think the same can be said when somebody goes to purchase a home, whether they're building it brand new or purchasing it from a, a private party. Uh, there are a whole host of, for example, if you, if you, let's use Facebook Marketplace as an example. I'm gonna list my house for sale uh, and I put it on Facebook Marketplace simply saying it's X amount. Well, that doesn't include all the other additional ancillary uh, fees that might be associated with actually being able to close on that property and have the title transferred to you. Uh, not including any taxes or fees imposed by the government at all levels, right? So I think those are some instances in which uh, these businesses are in good faith asking us to provide some of that clarity in the bill or maybe some exemptions or just provide a little understanding that there are instances in which it may not be very clear cut or black and white where their best answer to the consumer is the price by the time we deliver the good to you is still a little bit to be determined but you have our commitment to you that we're gonna work on giving you either a good approximate, <coughs> approximation or estimate, or by the time it is delivered, uh, we're obviously gonna shore it up for you. So all, all that to say, nobody's against trying to, uh, um, you know, make sure that people aren't being taken advantage of when it comes to, ju to junk fees, et cetera. But I also wanna make sure that we're acknowledging the practicality that exists in the marketplace that needs to take place between consumers and businesses and other individuals. So that's all I have to add, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Port. I appreciate it. Senator Duckworth, a couple comments from the chair. Uh, there were two testifiers who I thought had a compelling argument. I'd like to get your reaction to them. Uh, one of them from the hospitality industry pointed out the effective date, and I'm not positive actually in the delete everything that there is an effective date any longer, but I do have an oral amendment prepared if you're receptive to it that would create an effective date of August 1, 2025 to give industry a chance to implement these rules. Is that something that you'd be receptive to, Senator Port? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, it is. Okay. I will offer the oral amendment. The uh, um, council will report the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, Chair Klein moves to amend SF3537A2, page 2, after line 9, insert effective date. This section is effective August 1st, 2025. And for correction, I should not offer the amendment myself. It's offered by Senator Seberger. Um, any response to the amendment or any questions from the committee? Seeing none, all in favor of the Seeberger oral amendment say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Amendment is adopted. The other compelling piece of testimony that I don't have a fix for today, uh, but I thought was worth considering was the concern from the Minneapolis airport concessions that they have sort of a price cap on their uh, goods and this would 
sort of forced down their prices. So just something to work on. We're going to lay this bill over, and I think. Do you have any thoughts about that? I do, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, it, that is uh, what we're working with tax council on. Would that be considered a mandatory tax, a mandatory fee? Um, we think so. We want it to be included in something that, th that would be allowable for them to, uh, to include uh, as they do now. Um, but we're working with tax council to get that language correct. Great. Other member questions, comments, or amendments? Senator Howell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, you know, I, nobody likes hidden fees, or so I, I I do appreciate the intent. I guess my question leads to some of the online uh, eBay's, uh, Facebook Marketplace, those types. How does this play into that, and how uh, how does that regulation fit into those types of uh, processes? Senator Port. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Howe. Um, in the uh, DE amendment, the A2 uh, lines 2.5 through 2.8 um, are meant to address those sort of uh, auction type eBay, Facebook marketplace type sites. It's language that has been used successfully in other states to capture that market. Senator Howe. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I. I think that's an attempt. I don't know if it's clear enough uh, because some of that is not an auction. But, you know, the, it is true at auction houses you've got a, a lot of times a seller's surcharge or, and, 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 a, and a buyer's surcharge. Many times they get it on both ends. So, but I was thinking more like uh, someone just offering a good on, on eBay or Marketplace, to, not at an auction for a sale. but. Does, does, I'll, I'll leave that as it may, and we can have a discussion offline on that, but how, how does the medical community fit into this when they're offering services? Does this, have we looked at how that plays into this, uh, into this bill? Senator Port. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Howe. We have not had anyone from the medical industry reach out to us or suggest that this bill would in any way um, be relevant to medical services. I believe those are under a different chapter of law. Senator Hall. Well, and, that, 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 and I don't know that. I'm just thinking that uh, I know that uh, if you're going to go in and have some cosmetic surgery or you need, you've, you hear it all the time, you know, come to us, we'll fix your bunion, we'll do this, we'll do that. That is in a different ch chapter of law than what this would apply to uh, as far as advertising services and, and uh, Business, Senator Port. Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Howe, that's my understanding. I'm happy to circle back with you offline. Senator Frentz. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Senator Port. Uh, once again, you're before the Commerce Committee tackling an important and yet complicated subject. Just a couple tips for you as you go forward. Um, first of all, you have some credible testifiers here who have concerns, and I, I would like to try to draw my own view one, you talk about the tangible line that's kind of tough to explain. Good. That's exactly what people get mad about. What do you mean this fee? It has nothing to do with what you're doing. So I think the spirit of that work is um, well suited to you. I guess to those testifiers, I'm thinking Ms. Kadoon, um, Ms. Cook, and others, um, what they're saying is, hey, we already got some regulation here. Are you sure you're not risking making things worse or at least complicating it? Um, my own take, Mr. Chair, would be that for those industries that already have some pricing regulation, Legislative bodies like us have thought about it and said, okay, this is the rule for you. Um, thinking of auto dealers, for example, once a legislative body has said this pricing for the license and tab fees is the way you disclose it, I think that's where we have to be careful to say that is not the harm that causes Minnesotans to say, I'm upset. Uh, the concert ticket that your daughter's been dying to see where you stay online for an hour and then 10 minutes after you agree to it, they say, by the way, there's other fees. That's what drives people crazy. Uh, and you will have our support addressing that part most of all. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Daines. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Port. Just a question for you. A lot of the testifiers and they're up there are testifying and were indicating that there were some issues and stuff with the bill that they'd like to see worked out. You were nodding your head that you'd be willing to do that. I didn't see that when the auto dealers are up there. So I am concerned. Uh, are you willing to work with the auto dealers to try to get some of these issues re resolved so that we don't have the issues of border crossing? 
Senator Port. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Dames. Um, I, I believe the amendments that Senator Rasmussen brought will help do a great deal of that. Many of those are federal uh, or state requirements. Um, and the rest of them, things like uh, which license plate you choose uh, and how you choose to pay are not mandatory choices. And so those would not be covered under this fee anyway. But we are in continued conversation, happy to continue working with them. But I do believe with Senator Rasmussen's um, amendment today that it will alleviate m many of those concerns. Senator Dames. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Port. I appreciate that and appreciate your willing to uh, work with all of the groups to try to make this a better bill. Thank you. Other member questions or comments? Closing comments on the bill. Uh, you know, thank you everyone. I think this is a complex issue, but it is one that Minnesotans deserve to have us dig into. I appreciate your time uh, and energy here today. And I imagine I will be back in front of you with uh, some suggestions before you move an omnibus bill. Senate file 3537 as amended is laid over. Thank you, thank Senator you Mr. Port. Chair. Senator Daines. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Dames. And members, appreciate uh, the opportunity to share with you Senate File 4218. Uh, Senate File 4018 is a bill that we're bringing forward uh, to help with the township mutuals. Currently, a township mutual can only operate in 20 counties. And with the market that we're in right now, it's a very hard market. And uh, it's with problems with getting reinsurance and stuff, we're seeing some of these township mutuals that are starting to combine and go together. And so in that process, the 20 county program has been kind of tough on some of them. So this bill would ask to increase that to 40 counties so they could operate in 40 counties versus 20. Also in the bill, it adjusts the amount of reserves that they have in order to keep it the same as it would be per county. And then also, the, uh, uh, this bill also makes sure that uh, if you, for instance, currently if you merge and you have 21 counties, one of those counties you're going to have to shed. And when you shed that county, you have to notify the, the uh, policyholders that their policy expires on the date of the merger. This bill would change that so the policies would expire at the time of renewal. So that's kind of a basic of what the, of what the bill do, does on line 114. On line 114, it increases the county number from 20 to 40. On lines 227 to 232, it allows the comp companies with this merging uh, to operate, uh, their territories would go up to the number, up to the possible 40. And then uh, also this deals with the uh, amount of time that you would have to notify the individuals, the individual policy holders that due to the merger, you would, they would not be able to continue your policy and move that. So that is what the bill would do. And I have two testifiers, Adam Axvig and John Kelly. Adam, if you'd like to go. Senator uh, Dames, thank you. Senate File 4218 is in front of the committee. Uh, Mr. Axvig, please introduce yourself and proceed. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Adam Axvig, President and CEO of the Minnesota Association of Farm Mutual Insurance Companies. Chair Klein, I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of Senate File 4218 today. Mathrick members have been insuring Minnesotans since our association's first company was founded in 1860. MathMIC consists primarily of companies organized under statutes 66A and 67A, with 67A companies also known as township mutuals comprising the majority of our membership. Our members play a critical role in Minnesota's agricultural economy, which generates more than $106 billion annually in the state of Minnesota. Currently, our township mutuals are constrained to writing in 20 counties. This bill would expand that number to 40 counties and adjust statutory surplus minimums accordingly, 
which would allow our township mutuals to grow and foster greater competition in the marketplace, with the consumers being the ultimate beneficiary of that competition. A handful of our members have undergone mergers over the last several years. In the event of a merger, when the merged company exceeds the 20 county limit, that company is forced to cancel the policies outside the merged territory, disrupting consumers and forcing the company to cancel policies that they have had in some cases for generations. In addition to allowing township mutuals to write in a larger territory, this bill also allows those companies merging with policies outside the merged company territory to allow those policies to run their course instead of canceling those policies effective on the date of the merger. This provision lessens, this provision lessens the disruption for those policyholders policy insured by the companies who are merging. I appreciate the committee's willingness to hear this bill and lay it over so we can continue to work out the remaining differences with the stakeholders, in particular the Department of Commerce, so we can come to an agreement and perhaps incorporate this bill into the omnibus policy bill. I want to thank the bill authors, Senator Dames, for carrying this bill, as well as you, Mr. Chair, for granting this hearing. In addition, I want to thank the Department of Commerce and in particular, Mr. Kelly, for their willingness and commitment to working through the remaining issues so we, so we can create a stronger township mutual insurance industry for Minnesota. And with that, I will stand for any questions. Thank you, Mr. Axley. Mr. Kelly, please introduce yourself. Proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, uh, for the record, John Kelly, Director of Government Affairs for the Minnesota Department of Commerce. Um, we would like to thank uh, Senator Dames for bringing forward this bill and would echo uh, what has been said from MAFMIC and that we are currently very close to reaching peace in the valley on this bill. Um, the department has a c concerns in a few areas of this bill. The 20 to 40 increase, um, we believe that's a pretty high number and so we're trying to work out a number that we think uh, gets it right uh, for both you know, these companies that are playing an important role in the insurance market in Minnesota and we wanna see them continue to do so, but also make sure that they don't get overextended. And secondly, if they are going to go to, uh, to an increased uh, over the 20 county limit, we'd like to see some additional uh, reporting on more than an annual basis, likely on a quarterly basis. So we're close to working it out. We are confident that we should be able to do that. Um, and uh, we think that, you know, uh, a township mutual member told me earlier this week, there's never been a township mutual that has gone under, knock on wood, and the Department of Commerce wants to see that way. And we want to see these companies continue to play the vital role that they do play. Uh, in Minnesota. So we look forward to working with the author and with MathMic, and we think we'll see you again and hopefully have a broad agreement on this one. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Senator Rest. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, Mr. Kelly, um, what's the problem from go with going from 20 to 40? Why are you concerned about that? Mr. Kelly. Uh, Chair, Senator Rest. Um, so the the 20 county limit, uh, we, you know, these are part of the deal with the township mutual, part of the way we understand it is the, these folks have relationships with their members. They know their members, they know. And so to go from 20 to 40, roughly doubling it, it some of those, you know, things that come along with uh, township mutuals operations would be lost a little bit there. Uh, it would be over 40% of the state uh, to go from 20 to 40. Um, and so we think that we want to make sure that there's a number that's correct. I don't think it's going to be far off from that, but it's going to be uh, smaller than 40. Senator Ress. Oh, well, uh, thank you. But isn't it a, a maximum, um, 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 sir, or, or, um, <coughs> or Senator Dames, do you expect every single one of these companies to um, go from 20 to 40? I mean... Mr. Chair, Senator, Senator Rest, very likely not, but there could be situations to where you have a county that has 20, they merge with another county that has 20, so then you'd have your 40 limit. If that doesn't change, this merger would not be able to go through unless you eliminated several counties to get down to I the see. number lower than that. Okay. Thank Senator you. I, I think this is a good bill. I like it. So. Thank you. Member, questions or comments? Uh, any final comments, Senator uh, Dames? Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I would ask that Senate File 4218 be laid over for possible inclusion. I, I do feel this will be worked out within the next couple of days, and so then we'll have a bill that's ready to go. Senate File 4218 is laid over for possible inclusion. Senator Seeberger, and Mr. Kelly, you can stay at the table.
Welcome to the committee, Senator Seeberger. Senate file 4139 is in front of the committee, and you have an A1 author's amendment. Senator Seeberger moves the A1 author's amendment. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Bill is in the shape you'd like it. Senator Seeberger. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. It is my pleasure to present Senate file number 4139 for your consideration. This bill aligns practice with statute by eliminating outdated restrictions that inhibit the blending of ethanol and other oxygenates at both the refinery and gas station levels. The first provision eliminates a requirement from the statute that prevents blending ethanol or any other oxygenate with oxygenated fuel at refineries, while the second provision aims to remove language limiting gas stations from blending ethanol or other oxygenates into fuel after it has been blended elsewhere. It is increasingly more common for stations to make mid-level blends such as E15, E10, and E85. By repealing outdated language, this bill promotes consumer choice, supports businesses eager to meet market demands, and ensures that statutory barriers do not hinder prog progress in the gasoline market. And Mr. Kelly is here to testify on behalf of this bill. Mr. Kelly. Uh, thank you, Chair and members. I don't think I could say it better than Senator Seberger did. So this is a, a good bill brought forward by our Weights and Measures folks. We just want to have regulatory certainty for our station owners across the state. We thank uh, Flint Hills and uh, Fueling Minnesota for working with us to get this bill in shape that uh, everybody can agree to, and uh, we think it's a good bill. Mr. Kelly, can you just say your name for the record, please? Uh, apologies, Chair. Uh, John Kelly, Director of Government Affairs for the Minnesota Department of Commerce. Member questions or comments to 4139? Senator Prentice. Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Seberg, you forgot to mention the uh, lower carbon emissions that make this even better. <coughs> Mr. Senator Chair, Seberg. Senator Prentice, thank you. Members, uh, all those in favor of this, uh, I'm sorry, the Senate file 4139 is amended, will be laid over. Thank you, Senator Seberg. Senator Lance. We did. We did. Welcome to the committee, Senator Latz. Uh, Senate file 3358 is in front of us, and I believe you have an A1 author's amendment. I do. I move the A1 amendment. Senator Latz moves the A1 as an author's amendment. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? A1 is adopted. Senator Latz. Uh, Mr. Chairman, in 2015, a uh, consent order was entered into um, in, uh, uh, between the uh, bail bond industry and, and regulators uh, that set forth standards governing uh, the use and issuance of uh, bail bonds. Um, the bill that you have before you, um, in for the most part of the bill, simply codifies the terms and conditions of that consent order, so it becomes a statute uh, and uh, a binding in that regard as well. There are a couple of additional uh, provisions uh, in there um, to give you more detail relating to the bill itself. I ask you to consider the testimony uh, of Joel Bagnoli, who sits to my right. Welcome to the committee, Mr. Bagnoli. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, Joe Bagnoli with Winthrop & Weinstein Law Firm. I'm here on behalf of Midwest Bonding, uh, our bond company. Um, actually, Senator Latz, I, it, notably, we have a 13-page bill that changes no law. Uh, that's the interesting part. Only Senator Latz could come with a 13-page bill that does not change the law. It merely is, as Senator Latz noted, uh, reduces a consent order to uh, um, to law. A consent order, as a number of you know, only binds those people who those entities that sign the consent order. This then takes uh, this law has been in place, or this consent order has been in place, has been working well uh, for both the industry and I believe the department, and thus we'd like to convert it into law so that it would cover any future uh, entrance into the marketplace. I can say that uh, that the department has reviewed, um, and I'm sure that they would say if they hadn't, if they just saw differently, has reviewed this uh, legislation and has agreed that it is consistent with the consent order. Other bail bond agencies have reviewed this legislation 
and I believe they find it consistent as well. Uh, additionally, just so as I think it is relevant, uh, this wasn't prepared by the department or any bail bond agency. We went to uh, the revisor, Ryan Inman, who many of you know. Uh, he prepared it with the strict instructions to make it consistent. We believe we have made it consistent, thus it, no law is changing, just being applied broadly. That, thank you. Number of questions or comments, Senator Rest. Thank you, uh, Mr. Just Chair, Senator, Senator Rust. Uh, Mr. Bagnoli actually has a summary in front of him. He can provide you with exactly those details. No, no, Mr. Mr. Chair, uh, Senator, uh, Senator Rust. Mr. Bagnoli has a more detailed summary he can provide. Uh, Mr. Bagnoli, sent to you. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Rust. Um, I, and I can meet with you subsequently and go into it in more detail. Okay. Uh, the, the, the section deals with, uh, a portion of it deals with premiums. It requires bail bond producers or agents to charge only the rate filed uh, with the department that they, that they, or the surety that they contract with. In the past, there was some issues where the rate that, that they had filed with the department, people were doing less. This makes it law that they have to to be consistent with that. It sets minimum premiums that can be charged um, and that they may be received and how they may re be received, cash, money orders, et cetera. Uh, and then once the payment is received, how it is received and how it hit, the, the, the detail by which it is um, recorded and understood and uh, kept by the bail bond agency, deposited, maintained, and returned as appropriate. So there's a very uh, uh, well-documented regime, again, between the department and the bail bond agencies that's worked. Talks about collateral, um, uh, regarding the collateral that can be accepted. Sometimes people don't have cash, but they have collateral. Uh, it prohibits taking collateral in excess. You know, if you came and said, bail bond is $10,000, but I've got a car that's worth 30,000, you can't do that. Um, it so it provides a lot of, of language and uh, requirements around collateral. It gives the commissioner the authority to do producer audits. So under the consent order that, that that auditing ability uh, exists. This then puts it in statute so that any future. There's a great deal around solicitation, how solicitation can be done, frankly, how close to the jailhouse it can be done, in what manner it can be done, what can be, there was an issues with people offering or making uh, what some thought were undue offers of to get the business. So there is a whole section about solicitation. Um, so those are a, a number of the areas. They're far more detailed than I just went through, but it's sort of how the whole process of, of, of the bail transaction is done to make sure that both the uh, individual that's seeking bail and th the public is protected. Senator Rest. Further questions or comments from the committee or amendments? Members, uh, Senate file 3358 is amended. The motion is by Senator Seeberger that it be recommended to pass and referred to the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The bill is passed and sent to Judiciary. Members, we are waiting on a couple of authors. Senator Bolden. Senator Bolden, 
Uh, welcome to the committee. Senate file 4065 is in front of the committee. Do you have an author's amendment? Yes, Mr. Chair, the A3. Uh, Senator Wickland offers the A3 amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Bill is in the shape you would like. Senator Bolden to your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I am really pleased to be before you today with Senate file uh, 4065, um, also known as the Minnesota Debt Fairness Act. Every Minnesotan should be able to afford their lives. And businesses should be able to count on receiving uh, the money that they are owed. This bill looks to strike a balance at those two, at those two things. As we think about uh, debt that Minnesotans have, and I want to focus for just a moment on medical debt, um, which is a, a specific and different kind of debt. Uh, it's a debt that people don't choose to take on. Uh, if they have an accident or a diagnosis or an unexpected illness, uh, those costs can uh, increase very quickly and be devastating to people's lives. We have heard stories, and you will hear some of uh, those stories today, about the impact that has on people's lives and the ripple effect it has uh, in many other areas of their life. It can lead to bankruptcy. It can lead to not being able to afford rent and child care um, and have significant and devastating consequences. Uh, so this bill uh, aims to add some fairness into that system. We all believe that if uh, people owe a debt, they should pay it, and that system should be fair for all. Um, I uh, want to thank and, and point towards the amount of collaboration that has gone into this bill, uh, and that is reflected in the amendment that we just adopted. Uh, there have been a number of changes uh, based on good faith uh, collaboration, input, feedback from stakeholders on all sides of this issue. I am very grateful for that and uh, want to uh, uh, highlight that and note that, that those conversations continue. We have further conversations scheduled uh, just this week to continue that work, and we have come uh, a long way into closing the gaps of disagreement in uh, a few uh, specific spaces, and so I'm very grateful for that. Um, uh, so members, uh, I, we will, um, I, I also want to thank the Attorney General's office who has been working very closely in collaboration with us uh, with this bill and uh, we will hear from them as well to walk through the specifics of the bill. Um, but I want to reiterate the importance of um, looking at this as a whole and the impact it has on people's lives. Uh, really looking to add some fairness into the system where it is um, causing devastating effects uh, for families across Minnesota. Uh, so with that, Mr. Chair, uh, we'll turn to testifiers. Thank you, Senator Bolden. Can Mr. Bennett Hartz and Mr. Walt Myers please come forward? Welcome to the committee, Mr. Hartz. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Well, thank you, Senator uh, Chair Klein. My name is Bennett Hartz. I am an assistant attorney general in the Consumer Protection Division. Incidentally, when I was in college at the University of Minnesota, I was a nonpartisan intern for Senator Scheid, who is chair of this committee. So it's always good to be back in this room. Um, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair, and, uh, members of the committee. Um, thank you for hearing my story. <clears throat> Excuse me, my name is. Oh, I'm sorry to interrupt. Did they call us both up? But I think I'm going to talk first today. Okay. Uh, Mr. Hartz, go, go ahead. did you have testimony, sir? I, I do. Please proceed. The Office of the Attorney General appears here today to support Senate File 4065, the Minnesota Debt Fairness Act, which would help Minnesotans pay back their debts fairly and affordably without falling into poverty, bankruptcy, or further health crises in the process. The bill's current language reflects the author and the Attorney General's productive and ongoing conversations with stakeholders on all sides of this bill, including advocates for creditors and debtors, providers, patients, financial institutions, the state bar, and state agencies. Now, Senator Bolden has asked me to give this committee an overview of the bill's specific provisions, so I'm happy to do that. First, the bill would give patients protection against the worst hardships of medical debt. For example, it would allow patients to seek medically necessary care, regardless of whether they have outstanding medical debt. It would also follow numerous other states and likely soon the Federal uh, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau in prohibiting the reporting of medical debt to the credit reporting agencies. It would also reduce interest on medical debt to 4% from its current cap at 8%. 
it would further eliminate the Minnesota penalty against married couples that makes them automatically liable for each other's medical debt, a provision that makes Minnesota an extreme outlier among other states and results in extraordinarily difficult personal situations like couples facing the possibility of an unwanted to, uh, divorce to avoid financial hardship or recent widows and widowers filing unexpected bankruptcy to avoid uh, uh, the, the debt, the medical debt they've inherited from their deceased spouse. Um, additionally, the bill uh, language before you in this amendment would eliminate revenue recapture for the few remaining medical providers who use it. The bill would also require medical providers to make their collection practices available to the public and would enhance the ability for patients to challenge medical bills which they believe were wrongly coded by their providers or by uh, the insurance. Now second, the bill creates some basic consumer rights for patients with medical debt. Uh, for example, it allows patients who successfully defend against a wrongful lawsuit for medical debt to request payment of their costs and attorney's fees in the event that they're successful. It would also include protections against using false and misleading statements to collect medical debt uh, or using threats of illegal activity to compel payment of medical debt. Now, both the patients and the attorney general would have the ability to enforce these rights with patients having the ability to seek their damages as well as costs and attorney's fees if successful. Um, and just to be clear, uh, because we've had some contact from some stakeholders who want to be sure that this is clear in the language of the bill, this definition of medical debt in this bill would only apply to uh, debt directly owed to providers, um, it would not apply to medical expenses that are put on a credit card. Uh, those would be treated like any other credit card debt. Now, third, for all debts, the bill creates a basic protection from levy for a baseline amount of money in a person's bank account to prevent perfectly legal judgment collection from preventing someone from paying the very basics, like for their home or for groceries. Um, in doing this, Minnesota would join many other states that also have this baseline protection, like North Dakota, South Dakota, uh, Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, uh, and many others. Now, incidentally, this protection was the primary recommendation to come from a report on consumer debt published by the Minnesota State Bar Association a few months ago, and I believe um, that the State Bar Association uh, recommends this protection be included in this bill. Now, the bill uh, currently proposes protecting an aggregate of $4,000 across all bank accounts, meaning a, a total across all of a person's bank accounts, not to exceed $4,000. This is a reduction from the bill's original proposal to match Wisconsin's $5,000 protection. Um, I also want to say that the bill authors and the attorney general and all interested stakeholders have had uh, a number of really productive meetings to work on this proposal um, in detail and that we're all continuing to discuss it and refine it further so that this bill can strike the, the right balance between um, the perfectly valid right of a collector to uh, a collected debt against the need for debtors to still be able to meet those, those basic expenses like keeping a roof over their head or, or food on the table. Now the bill also creates a new garnishment level uh, system that's based on income. This is, I think, a really thoughtful proposal that was brought to the bill authors by a creditor advocacy group. Now what the current law on garnishment currently does is exempts everyone below a certain income threshold, which is basically about $22,000 a year from garnishment completely. And then above that level, everyone is subject to the same flat garnishment rate of 25%. Now, this bill introduces two intermediate steps between exempt and 25%. Um, there would be a level for people who are making just above minimum wage, where they could be garnished at 5% of their income. People in a wage level just above that would be able to be garnished at 15% of their income. And then someone earning at or about median income for a single person um, and, and above would be garnished at the existing rate of 25%. Now, 
the goal of this proposal, again, which is one that came out of conversations with stakeholders and came to, uh, directly from a, a creditor advocacy group, um, would, would help the working poor, it would help the working class and people in the lower uh, middle income levels um, uh, afford wage garnishment without falling off the cliff into the poverty cycle um, from which it's, it's very, very difficult to escape. Uh, now, this bill would also apply Minnesota's garnishment laws to independent contractors and to self-employed people and would also apply Minnesota garnishment laws to all people who live and work in Minnesota, which it currently does not. Finally, the bill would modernize the list of basic property that people get to retain when going through bankruptcy. For example, Minnesota's state law uh, contains protections for phonographs and for TV antennae, uh, but this would update it to create a protection for your cell phone and personal computer. Um, Minnesota state law also currently protects the family Bible. This modernization would also protect a family Torah or Quran um, and similarly sacred, sacred religious possessions up to a specific dollar threshold. Uh, it would also bring some important uh, coverage to some gaps in Minnesota's protections. For example, it would protect a tradesman's work truck uh, or it would protect the primary vehicle of somebody with a mobility impairing disability. Um, it would also create a modest uh, bankruptcy-only wild card exemption um, of $4,000, which is something that most Minnesotans in bankruptcy get to use anyway, um, but a, a certain subset of people who use Minnesota state bankruptcy laws don't. Um, these are mostly young working families and, and seniors who use our, our state laws in bankruptcy. So the Debt Fairness Act seeks to make the uh, debt collection um, and medical debt collection processes more fair for everyone so that these challenging but uh, necessary components of the financial system can operate without letting people fall into poverty and so that they can instead have the opportunity to pay back their creditors with, with dignity. Um, to that end, the Attorney General's Office supports passage of this bill. Thank you all for your time and for your attention to this very critical matter. Thank you, Mr. Hartz. Uh, and as you clear the table, could we have Ms. Lemer uh, come to the table? But please stay around to be available for questions, sir. Mr. Walt Myers, please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. <clears throat> My name is Walt Myers. I'm from Lakeville. I'm a lifelong resident of Minnesota and a father of three. I'm an Army veteran, a cancer survivor, and I'm also a volunteer at Cancer Legal Care. My wife, Sue, battled breast cancer for 23 and a half years. In January of 2019, we were informed by our oncologist that Sue's cancer had metastasized to her liver. And while there were treatments, uh, treatment options available, uh, her doctor didn't think any of them would do much good. Sue immediately told her doctor that she was done. She didn't want any more chemotherapy. So after 23 and a half years, my wife became a hospice patient. It was her wish to stay in our home for as long as, long as possible, and the hospital put us in contact with an in-home hospice team that provided Sue with exceptional care for the last two months of her life. During that time, I began to receive EOBs, or explanation of benefits, from the insurance company. And these EOBs were usually many pages long, explaining the services that had been provided. <clears throat> At first, I tried to reconcile them, but I couldn't. It was, it was just overwhelming. On the first page of each EOB was printed, this is not a bill. So I ended up just making a stack of them on, on my desk. Shortly after Sue's passing, the EOBs turned into actual bills, and sometimes for thousands or even tens of thousands of dollars. I couldn't understand what was happening because the charges far exceeded what my plan said I should owe. And I was confronted with what was becoming a significant medical debt that I didn't understand and I had no idea what to do about. At first I tried dealing with the bills myself, calling people who I thought might be able to help me. Most were sympathetic, but no one really know what, knew what to do. Fortunately, I somehow remembered a comment a social worker made to us during one of Sue's treatments at the camp cancer center. And she told us if you ever need legal help, there's this organization called Cancer Legal Care that provides free legal services to cancer patients in Minnesota. 
And at the time, I remember thinking to myself, well, you know, why would I ever need something like that? So I called them and explained what was happening, and they put me in contact with their um, insurance expert. And with the help of my former employer, we found a way to contest the bills. And after a few stressful weeks of waiting, we got a response back from the insurance company. The entire amount, amount had been forgiven, all of it. $135,000 of surprise out-of-network medical debt was gone. I can only imagine what my life would be like now if I hadn't remembered that seemingly random comment made by the social worker that day. I might still be making monthly payments on a six-figure medical debt that I actually didn't owe. So I suppose it would come, uh, I suppose no one would be surprised if I said I wholeheartedly support the effort to ban the transfer of medical debt to a patient's spouse. And I would respectfully encourage the members of the committee to do the same. The elimination of Sue's medical debt was a life-changing moment for me. And eliminating spousal debt could have an equally life-changing effect for many Minnesotans. So please pass this bill and make it a reality in Minnesota. I believe it's the right thing to do. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Myers. Appreciate you sharing your story. And can you make room, please, for Mr. Andrew Walker. Uh, Ms. Lemer, please introduce yourself and proceed. Mr. Chair and members of the committee, my name is Amy Lemmer, and thank you for allowing me to share my story. In September of 2021, I filed for divorce. In trying to navigate this, sorry, I was living in a very volatile environment. Things continued to get worse. On December 31st, my soon-to-be ex-husband told me that he was going to buy a gun, and I better not be there when he got back. My sons and I moved out the next day. He threatened me daily. His exact words were, I'm going to make you homeless, bankrupt, and a convicted felon and lose your children. I was able to achieve full-time status at my job, but having to start over, the financial strain was severe. About, about a month later, our HR representative advised me my check was going to, be start, was going to start being garnished by a law firm for a total of over $600 a month. I was shell-shocked and panicked. I would never want anyone else to have this feeling. I was barely making ends meet. The sleepless nights and anxiety became worse and worse. I called them and told them about the domestic violence, or financial and emotional terror that I was going through. If that garnishment continued, I could not provide for my sons. I never got noticed that my funds could be protected or that I would, had an exemption, nothing. As the garnishment continued, I fell behind my bills and my gas was shut off. Another law, another law firm couldn't garnish my wages froze my bank account and withdrew over $750 of my child support. This was financially de debilitating. If this bill would have been in effect during my crisis, it would have helped me immensely. This debt was from 2007, and it was renewed not once, but twice. The part of the bill that would prevent that would have helped me tremendously. As I was fleeing my abuser, my family members were helping me with loans to pay my bills. If this bill were in effect back then, the my, the money in my account would have been protected so I could just cover my basic needs. I would not have gone through so much financial and emotional suffering. I would never want another person to go through the hopelessness, anxiety, and the fear of not being able to provide for their family. This is why I hope you support this, this bill moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lemer, and thank you for your courage in sharing your story. Can Mr. Uh, uh, Ms. Dana Bacon please come to the table, and Mr. Andrew Walker, please introduce yourself and proceed. <coughs> Uh, chair and members of the committee, my name is Andrew Walker, and I'm a consumer bankruptcy attorney in Minneapolis. I solely represent Minnesotans in personal bankruptcy. I help people who, because of illness, disability, unemployment, underemployment, or some other personal calamity, are forced to consider, often tearfully to be honest, bankruptcy relief, relief against aggressive creditors. In Minnesota, the Constitution guarantees people a reasonable amount of property to be protected from creditors. Our list of reasonable property, however, was made many decades ago, and it was designed for a primarily agricultural economy. The world has changed, and now most Minnesotans work for wages in a digital world and buy necessities from the supermarket using their wages. We believe the list of bankruptcy exemptions should also be updated for the modern economy. Let me give you some examples. Our current statute protects a phonograph, but not a cell phone. It protects a family Bible and a library, but not a laptop computer. It protects foodstuffs, and $13,000 worth of livestock, but it does not protect even one penny in a checking account that a debtor might use to buy groceries. It protects the rights of an injured person to bring a lawsuit in the future for damages, 
But the minute the debtor has paid those damages, the money is no longer protected. Minnesota is a progressive state, but it is falling behind our neighbors, such as Wisconsin, Iowa, and both, the, both Dakotas for the question of what property people can keep when filing bankruptcy. At present, financially unfor unfortunate Minnesotans must lose one year of tax refunds, their snowblowers, computers, cell phones, firearms, their vehicle, if it's worth more than $5,000, and any money in checking or savings accounts that they have on the day they file bankruptcy. These items are necessary to get on in life in this day and age. Furthermore, things like snowblowers, cell phones, firearms, these are of no value to creditors, but they are of great value to debtors. It helps no one when bankrupt debtors must turn these things over to creditors in order to uh, get a fresh start. I urge you to pass this bill and restore dignity to our debtors in Minnesota. Thank you, sir. And can you please make room for Mr. Dan Lee? Uh, I'm sorry, for Mr. Danny. Yes, yeah, so Mr. Dan Lee. Uh, Mr. Bacon, please introduce yourself and proceed. Good afternoon, Chair Klein and members. My name is Dana Bacon. I'm from Rosemount, and I'm Senior Director of State Government Affairs for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. I'm here today in support of Senate File 4065 as amended. You should have a letter in your packet signed by my organization, as well as the ALS Association, the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network, the ARC of Minnesota, Cancer Legal Care, Minnesota Association of Community Health Centers, Minnesota Budget Project, Minnesota Nurses Association, National Kidney Foundation, and National Multiple Sclerosis Society. Whew. These are just some of the groups who hope you will support this legislation today. As we all know, medical debt causes serious economic, emotional, and physical harm. Last fall, LLS joined ACS CAN and RAP Medical Debt in conducting a survey of 2,600 Americans on this topic. We found that nearly half of those surveyed said they'd experienced medical debt themselves. Of those who faced debt, about 40% said they felt embarrassed or ashamed of their debt. So you can imagine for people who come forward to tell you their stories about medical debt, they're doing it at really serious cost to themselves. It's not an issue that invites you to brag about it. It's tough. And a similar number of people said they delayed or skipped care because they were afraid they might fall further into debt. I mean, we need better protections for Minnesotans facing these challenges, and Senator Bolden's bill will help. We strongly support lowering interest rates on medical debt, and we also support keeping medical debt out of credit scores so that when people want to stay a part of the economy, the economy will work well enough for them. I mean, medical debt is not something you choose to get. And we're also glad that this bill prevents medical systems from blocking access to care for people who are carrying an outstanding debt. Thank you. Patients aren't asking for a free pass. I mean, they're asking for a fair shot. And I think that's worth saying again, we're not looking for a free pass, we're looking for a fair shot. I wanna thank Senator Bolden for bringing this bill forward and thank those of you on the committee who are co-authors of the bill. I'd also like to thank Governor Walls and the Attorney General's office for their work on this issue. Hope you'll move this bill forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bacon. Can you please make room for Mr. Danny Ackert? Mr. Mm -hmm. Lee, please introduce yourself and proceed. Chair Klein, members of the committee, thank you for this opportunity and good afternoon. My name is Dan Lee. I'm the general counsel of the Minnesota Credit Union Network on behalf of Minnesota's credit unions serving over uh, 2 million uh, Minnesotans. I wanna thank Senator Bolden and Representative Ryer, the many stakeholders, the Attorney General's office, in the work thus far, the continuing work that's necessary to help persons facing uh, medical and consumer debt beyond their financial obligations and circumstance to work on critical areas uh, in setting garnishment and debt collection standards that are fair, equitable, and equally accessible to all Minnesotans uh, that do not conflict with related areas such as the bankruptcy code. To not have the un unintended consequence of affecting Minnesotans through the financial institutions and the regulatory agencies that have the honor to serve them by creating undue burden uh, on their already heavily regulated day-to-day -day, uh, operational obligations. I thank you for the time. Thank you. Mr. Eckert, uh, please introduce yourself and proceed. And can I, in the meantime, have Ms. Jessica Klander come to the table? 
Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Danny Ackert with the Minnesota Hospital Association. The Hospital Association is concerned that provisions in Senate File 4065 as amended pertaining to medical debt in combination are not appropriately balanced and will lead to more nonprofit hospitals and healthcare providers generally taking on increased levels of unrecoverable bad debt. This uh, in, in totality may come at the expense of securely sustaining the already precarious state of the healthcare workforce, care capacity, and patient access that Minnesotans need. In 2022, hospitals wrote off roughly 537 million in bad debt with 280 million of that total, over half coming from insured patient care costs. According to the Commonwealth Fund, Minnesota has the lowest amount of medical debt in the country. And based on a recent report from the Attorney General's Office and the Minnesota State Bar Association, it was found that the average medical uh, debt loss in Minnesota involved about $1,500, and that many patients find that they cannot pay for even routine medical expenses, even with insurance, because deductibles and copays are too high. As such, we support legislation introduced by Senator Mann and co-authored by Senator Bolden, Senate File 4012, that shifts the responsibility of collecting copays and deductibles from ambulance and emergency department services from the healthcare provider to the individual's insurance company. This legislation is an example of some of the balance we need on Senate File 4065 because our member nonprofit hospitals and health systems are acute, provider, acute care providers first and foremost. They are not debt collectors. They don't want to be debt collectors. And I will argue that they are better suited than any other type of care provider to understand that no one chooses an emergency, no one chooses a cancer diagnosis, and no one chooses health care expenses. Life happens. Medical care is often needed at the time when you don't want it the most. And, that, that, and, it, and because of this is why Minnesotans rely on hospitals to be available 24-7, 365, for whatever life requires. This is our mission. That mission is under incredible stress. And Senate File 465 at this time is not appropriately balanced um, to account for our concerns. In closing, we are encouraged by and grateful for the collaboration that Senator Bolden has extended along with the Attorney General's office including another uh, meeting bright and early tomorrow morning. And we remain committed to find the right balance between how to help individuals better afford the healthcare services they need, often at times where they don't know they're gonna need it. Uh, and uh, again, balance that with, to ensure that our nonprofit hospitals are paid for services that have been delivered. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Ackert. And can you make room for Mr. Derek Weber, please? Ms. Klander, please introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Jessica Klander, and I'm an attorney at Basford Remley. I'm here on behalf of the Great Lakes Credit and Collections Association, or GLICA for short. First, I would like to thank Senator Bolden, the Attorney General's Office, and Legal Aid for engaging with us over the past few weeks to address our concerns and to remove some of the most concerning aspects of the bill. While we do have some remaining concerns, Glicka is committed to continuing this dialogue and know that we will, so thank you. It's important that any changes made to the laws governing the collections process be done with a focus on balance, which many have said already. We recognize some consumers face serious hardships and need protections, but we also must have a process that allows those that can pay their debts to do so. Balance is the lens through which we are viewing this legislation. Glicka will have input on the medical debt provisions as they move forward, but our most significant concern and focus are on the changes to the wage and bank garnishment aspects of the bill. Though one of the last options for collections, garnishment may be the only way to collect in some instances. The bill proposes a $4,000 wildcard exemption on bank accounts. This will effectively prohibit the use of bank garnishments as a collection tool in Minnesota. Very few people maintain a $4,000 account balance at any given time, and those that do can simply move money around between their accounts to avoid the obligation. Often a bank garnishment summons is the first time a consumer engages and responds to the collection activities that have been gone going for years. This allows an opportunity to work with the consumer toward a payment plan and negate the need for the garnishment at all, a positive result for both parties. As proposed, this exemption is also self-executing. That means it's automatic rather than requiring the consumer to, con to claim the exemption. That's unlike other exemptions. That prompts additional concerns with misuse and unintended application. Glicka is open to the discussion of a bank account exemption that is more balanced, both in the amount and the process, so that bank garnishments can remain a viable collection tool. Specifically, we appreciate the recent discussions around an alternative structure to the wage garnishment limits that would focus on protecting lower income Minnesotans. 
The language as currently proposed does not limit the exemption based on need and would provide extended protections to even the wealthiest consumers. And that is something that is continuing in this dialogue. Glicka is still evaluating the details of the alternative structure that's been proposed, but the focus on protecting consumers who need it the most and uh, not those that are the wealthiest signals a movement towards the balance that is so critical here. The collections and garnishment processes are complex. Changes must be examined closely in relationship to one another to ferret out any unintended consequences. Glickler remains committed to continuing our active engagement in the discussion of this bill, and we greatly appreciate Senator Bolden's uh, willingness to work with us towards that goal in a more balanced proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Weber, please introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you, Committee Chair. Uh, my name is Derek Weber. I'm an attorney with uh, Messerly Kramer. I've been an attorney in the state for 30 years, uh, the last 22 years in my current role. Over that lifetime, I've represented consumers and creditors. I'm here today on behalf of the uh, Minnesota Creditors Rights Association. This is an organization of about 20 law firms and over 50 lawyers that kind of represent creditors in court proceedings. And so we have a lot of experience in working with and through these types of scenarios. And first of all, I'd like to say happy Pi Day. I hope you get a piece of pie later on today. Yeah, it's Pi Day. So right now, Famous Dave is giving away free pie. <laughs> we have a long history of working with uh, legal aid, uh, with the Attorney General, with many of you. Senator Latz is here. We've done many jobs, uh, many uh, legislative acts with Senator Latz. Um, we come to the table with ideas. We come to the table with solutions. We try to find balance and, and work with uh, our, uh, our colleagues in that regard. One constant theme that we've all had over the years, over the last 20 years, is that everyone agrees that everyone should repay their voluntary obligations. Um, this is a bill uh, that strikes to balance how that happens, right? And so to how we get people to repay their, um, their, their voluntary obligations, as opposed to the medical bill, uh, which is an involuntary uh, obligation. And I want to make sure we distinguish that because some of the things that apply here um, uh, apply to really only the voluntary uh, obligations that we're seeking to have people repay. Um, we want to strike that balance, um, and, and we're working with, and we have made some really good movements um, that have brought us together to, uh, to the table and resulted in this uh, current amendment. But it, our organization believes it still goes too far and we still have work to do. The second piece of it is, even when we do come to a resolution, we've got a lot of work to do to fix all of the different forms to fix all of the different other uh, statutes where these things are all interconnected and to make that all happen. Now, the proponents of this bill had been working on it for six months or more over the summer behind closed doors. We weren't involved in that process. We weren't invited to be involved in that process. And so we're just now seeing this and we just respectfully kind of want to have the opportunity to dig through this and work with them and produce a bill that makes sense, uh, that supports what everybody has come to the table and agrees with. Um, and so we are uh, respectfully really not opposing, but uh, um, uh, we're asking for the bill to be laid over so we can finish those negotiations, finish all the, the work that has to be done, and that we can um, partner with all of the proponents of this bill to come up with workable solutions. And we have other uh, ideas in mind as well. So um, our... our uh, Opposition, if you will, to this bill isn't really opposition. It's more, um, please give us the time to uh, to come up with uh, some some good solutions that we think will work in favor. All right, thank you. Number questions or comments, Senator Rasmussen. <coughs> thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, the bill author, for. Um, working with a lot of different stakeholders in your bill, as you know, touches lots of different industries and uh, people that we've heard from here today. Um, one question I had, Mr. Chair, for the bill author is on, and I'm looking at the A3DE, um, section five, starting at page three, line 30. And this is the out-of-pocket maximum or cost-sharing requirement. Um, and the reason I wanted to point out this provision in the bill is that it's, maybe it's the only part of the bill that doesn't directly relate to either medical debt or consumer debt. Um, 
And I guess, Mr. Chair, the question for the bill author is if she could explain why this is included in this broader bill. And uh, before I answer, I might have Mr. Hartz from the Attorney General's office come back to the table just so he's available to supplement any answers. Uh, Senator Bolden. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Rasmussen, for the question. Um, I, and I appreciate the question. So this section um, is around uh, what's commonly known as copay accumulators, uh, which uh, relates to the broader uh, piece of the bill because it is an expense for patients. Uh, you know, there are many uh, drugs, pharmaceuticals, that are quite expensive. Um, one of the groups that we have been working with on this bill um, is the, the Rare Disease Coalition, and certainly for those patients, medications can be very, very expensive. And so there are um, uh, discounts that uh, pharmaceutical company, drug companies provide for some drugs, um, but those uh, discounts that are provided by the drug companies don't count towards patients' Uh, out-of-pockets costs through their insurance plans. And so um, this would uh, remedy that. And it, it connects because it, it um, accumulates. It's part of the, the, the medical bills that patients are paying. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and thank you, Senator uh, Bolden, for that explanation. I would say one of the concerns that I have, and, and this is a broader fight between uh, payers and pharmaceutical companies kind of over the economics and drug pricing. Um, and so I just have some concerns about kind of including this in a what I kind of view as largely a consumer debt uh, bill. Um, and I guess, you know, one of the practices that I'm probably concerned about is you could have pharmaceutical companies that are effectively trying to eliminate any uh, patient cost sharing in an attempt to basically, you know, gain leverage over pricing over payers and kind of using, um, you know, their money or these discounts to basically end up creating more costs ultimately for consumers through higher costs on pharma and through uh, premium costs. And so, Mr. Chair, the question for the bill author is, are you open to having any kind of limitations so that we don't kind of open this up so that pharmaceutical companies uh, can basically have free reign over how, how they're pricing their drugs. Senator Bolden. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the question. Uh, certainly open to continue conversations on this, and I'll note uh, this bill does also have to go to HHS for this provision and some others. Uh, you know, I certainly am not looking to give uh, pharmaceutical companies free reign over anything, um, but really the, you know, the driver for me is uh, uh, cost for patients and what that looks like for patients who, who are you know paying very high costs for drugs? You know, in some cases that are keeping them alive or keeping their children alive. And so, looking at ways um, that we can help those patients. Um, so, yes, happy to have more conversations. So, uh, Senator Rasmussen. Okay. Further questions or comments, Senator Rust. Uh, thank you, um, um, Mr. Chairman. I, I just have a few clarifications so I can understand things. Um, on um, page five, line five point one eight, you say a subject is section is subject to section sixty two J point eight oh seven. What's that, Mr. Chairman, Senator Bolden? Senator Bolden, if you like, we can have counsel respond. Or um, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Ms. Siverson. Uh, thank. Oh, I'm sorry. Please go ahead. One of you. Uh, Mr. Hartz. Thank you, Chair Klein. Uh, Senator Rest, 62J807 is earlier in the bill. Um, you can see the section being referenced here. This has to do with uh, uh, prohibiting uh, or, or um, requiring that people are allowed to receive medically necessary care regardless of whether they owe a hospital bill. Senator Rest. Okay, so it, it's an, it is indeed new language, but it's a reference to it. Is that Mr. correct? Mr. Hartz. <clears throat> Chair, uh, Senator Rest, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear your question. Say it's new language, but it's a reference to it here looking back. Mr. Hartz. Uh, Chair Klein, yes, Senator Rest, that's correct. Thank you. And Senator on, Rest. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Bolden, um, on 6.28, and 2-9, could you tell me what a shame card and a shame automobile are? I've never heard that phrase before. 
Senator, one of them. Senator Bolden. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not quite sure I heard your question, but I think you're asking about... Uh, Line 6.28, it says you can't publish or cause to be published any list of debtors use shame cards or shame automobiles. What are they? Mr. Hartz. Chair Klein, Senator Rest, these provisions are taken from an existing statute, 332, which applies to um, uh, third-party debt collection and debt buyers and applies it in the medical debt context. This particular provision about shame cards, um, shame cards and shame automobiles what is a... What are uh, it's a, these are, um, this is an old debt collection tactic of sending some, posting publicly on somebody's front door, for example, that they owe a debt, or having a, a vehicle come to their house that says on the outside, like, you know, debt collection. Um, this is a tactic that back when, when the collection of debt was first a, a, a matter of national priority in the 1970s, was a tactic that, that legislature saw and saw fit to include uh, in state laws regulating collection of debt. Well, well Mr. Mr. Chairman and Sir, Senator Bolton, it seems like to me there must be a better um, reference to, to that. If, if you're just reading this, you wouldn't know what a shame automobile <laughs> is. I guess, I mean, if you're modernizing a, sta a statute from 50 years ago, that would seem to me to be something that you would um, take a look at. Um, I um, also um, uh, just want to comment that on um, uh, lines t uh, subdivision four of section 22, where you're um, listing all of the things, I really like this, Senator Bolden wanted to tell you, of what, um, uh, what it cannot be taken and that is um, all of the credits that we offer in the, in the tax sections of the law. You can't take um, the tax refund. You can't take um, any of the, uh, of the credits we offer, including the, uh, um, the new credits, the, the child tax credit. And I, I just, just wanted to let you know I appreciated that. Um, and then... Um, um, uh, on page 25, lines 24 and 25, um, we today heard uh, in the Legislative Audit Commission a report from the OLA on all of the uh, difficulties and challenges um, that occur um, for Dolly and Deed and the Department of Revenue in determining who is who is an employee under federal law and who is a, an independent uh, contractor. And it seems to me that you're including both of those no matter how they're characterized. And I think that that is a, um, a, a very important um, inclusion here so that um, there can be no no confusion when someone gets money for doing work. And um, it's, um, it's very, um, uh, there's a lot of challenges um, in, the, in those definitions because they're different across all agencies. But by having a, a, um, a more general description of it in your bill here, it, um, uh, it minimizes anyone getting out from uh, from under that. Um, so I, um, I just want you to know how much I um, appreciate that. And then on section 49, um, I think there is uh, other, other bills that talk about, this is on lines 31, 2, and 3. Um, there are other bills that are talking about presenting things to consumers, to citizens and so forth um, um, about their rights under the law, that it be done in, in um, plain language. And um, I think that is uh, a, a very important part of this bill, regardless of what it is applied to. But I don't understand a definition of plain language. 
and I wondered if you'd consider that, uh, have you considered that um, when you um, uh, use um, uh, AI um, applications, you can ask for something to be um, an answer to be given to you at a third or fourth grade level, or you can ask for it to be um, given to you at a level of a high school student, um, and there's a vast difference between the two to say nothing of a, um, you know, a high-level professional. But what does plain language mean here, Senator Bolden? Senator Bolden or Mr. Hertz? Chair Klein, Senator Est, um, thank you for, for asking about that. I believe uh, we received a letter in support today from the Center for Plain Language that highlighted that same question and proposed alternative language that the bill could use to make more clear what is meant by plain language. So our intention would be to use the organization whose job is to work with plain language um, in, in getting that definition right in this bill. Um, Mr. Senator Chairman Rest. and Senator Bolden and sir, I think, um, I think that's really important that you can be as specific as possible because somebody is going to litigate on uh, the, um, the definition of plain language and say that they are doing it and then the other person is going to say, no, they're not. But if you can be as specific as possible, and that, that's really great that you got that kind of letter, seems to me that that would improve prove, um, the, um, uh, the strength of the language in this section. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Frentz. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Bolden. Uh, you get the gold star for the work that you put in here on behalf of the people that uh, have lived this situation. I especially appreciate um, the engagement with the stakeholders to try to get it better. I believe you're going to be successful. A couple comments in the spirit of helping. Um, I do have concerns about the wild card 4,000 on garnishment, but I, I don't propose we get into that. Just want you to know one of the members had that concern. And then I guess um, to the, the question that we get into in commerce sometimes, I know the path is to judiciary here. Uh, we're lucky to have, maybe it's not anymore, but I think um, my question for the author would be, how can we create the best space for you to finalize the agreement? I know you have more work to do, um, and I guess if we're considering laying it over, that'd be easy. Um, but just wanted to give you a chance to say um, what the path is that best allows you to get that done. And I think Senator Latz's point is a valid one. We've had in other bills, which is let's do the commerce work um, in commerce, let's do the judiciary work in judiciary. And so if there's more commerce-related work to do, um, let us know. We can lay it over, and if not, off we go. Thank you, Senator Bolden. Thank you to the testifiers. Um, see you at the finish line. I'll let Senator Bolden advise us to the path, but the plan for today, members, was to pass this to the Committee on Health and Human Services. At some point, it does need to touch the Committee of Judiciary, um, and I know the author has been diligent in working with the Department of Commerce and, and resolving uh, issues there. Um, Senator Bolden, do you have any further comments on that? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Senator Frentz, for the question. Uh, respectfully, I would uh, ask that we uh, move the uh, move the bill to our next uh, committee stop. We are actively involved in conversations. As was mentioned, we have a meeting scheduled tomorrow morning. Uh, we are very close. We have uh, made great strides, and we are very close to closing the final gaps. I fully believe we are all committed to that work, and I fully believe we can do that in the in the time between uh, you know this committee stop and the next. Um, we're we're committed to that work. So thank you. Senator Latz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I assume it's going to be at some point, as you characterize it, touching Judiciary Committee because of the 8.31 enforcement provision. Um, maybe there's something else in the bill as I'm reading through it that, that invokes uh, that jurisdiction as well. But um, I just want to see if I'm reading this Properly, First of all, Section 8.31 has been read more broadly in recent uh, Minnesota judicial uh, decisions um, uh, with regard to the ability to bring lawsuits to enforce it. Uh, so it, it's, uh, it's a very broad mechanism. I generally support that availability for claimants to be able to use 8.31. Um, I'll note that there's strict liability in here. Uh, for that, and there's a thousand dollars per violation, additional damages as the court may allow. Is it correct that that one thousand uh, dollar cap is essentially uh, uh, there's a cola for it later on, uh, like two paragraphs later in the bill, if I'm reading it? 
properly the dollar amount limit in paragraph B clause two changes um, with the CPI, is that correct? Senator Latz, I feel as though I'm on Judiciary Committee and I am appropriately depressed. Mr. Hartz. <laughs> Chair Klein, Senator Latz, uh, yes, it changes over time, but note that that is a, uh, that $1,000 is a cap. It's a, a limit, right. not a flat amount. So it's ultimately up to the, the judge or, or other judicial officer overseeing it, what would be an appropriate award. Um, of course, they could award a dollar for something that's, that's nominal. Um, if that answers your question. Thank Senator Letts. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair um, and Mr. Harnett, um, there was also mention in your initial presentation that the interest rate on the medical debt, which is currently 8%, is being reduced to a cap of 4%. Is that my understanding? Mr. Hartz. Uh, Mr. Hartz. Uh, Chair Klein, yes, Senator Latz, that's correct. Mr. Senator Latz. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hartz, is, is that intended to float as well or to be linked in any or indexed in any way to uh, federal funds rate or prime rate or anything like that, or is it going to be just a hard statutory cap? Uh, Chair Klein, Mr. Sen Hartz. Senator Latz, the, the current version of the bill doesn't anticipate a, a change. Um, we have a meeting tomorrow morning with um, all the stakeholders on the, the medical piece of it, including specifically to talk about this, and I'm sure that we would like to consider whether that would be appropriate for this bill. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Hartz, um, I would encourage looking into that. Uh, we know just in the last couple of years how much interest rates have, have shifted. Um, they're going up, they're going down. Um, and uh, at some point, a cap of 4% would be below the cost of carrying a debt, perhaps substantially below the cost of carrying a debt. Um, and then the question would be, what's the appropriate cap? Um, so I'd encourage you to take a look at that. Um, I share Senator Frentz's uh, encouragement to take a look at that $4,000 uh, limit as well. Um, my understanding is the intent of that was to allow a person to be able to cover the cost of rent and food so they don't get left with zero in their bank account to cover real critical necessities. Um, but uh, I'd respectfully submit most people's cost of rent and food um, aren't close to $4,000 a month. Um, if they are, then they probably have the ability to make some additional payments on uh, medical debt as well. It's a separate question from whether or not the medical debt is legitimate, it's appropriate, all of that. But when you get to the point of levying, it seems to me $4,000 is a bit high, and, and my understanding from the Attorney General's office is that there are conversations in the range of 2000 2500 which, and it was cited to me that that's a more accurate reflection of sort of the baseline rent and food costs uh, for people, or mortgage and food costs. So I would uh, I'm not going to sit here and tell you which number I think is best, but it, it just seems to me 4000 is a bit high from that standpoint. Otherwise, if medical debt is a legitimate debt, either we find a way to forgive it or we find a way to assign the costs to someone who's in a position or some state entity that's in a position to cover it, um, or we make it collectible as a practical matter. Um, and so um, we've got to, my judgment is in the collectible part, there's got to be enough availability of funds to collect to make that, in fact, collectible. So um, that's the way I would look at it. Um, I was looking at the uh, garnishment provisions also that Mr. Hartz, you cited um, in the bill or in your presentation. Um, and I think this was on page 26 of the A3 limitation on wage garnishment. And um, I don't know from personal knowledge whether the, the interim provisions in here are going 25, 15, 5 percent um, or so on um, are the right numbers. So I'm not going to quibble with those, but it's a, it's a drafting question. I'm a little bit confused. 
um, each of the uh, the new languages end with a reference to the greater of the hourly wages described in section 571.922 paragraph A clause 2 which is that middle clause starting on line 9 going to line 11 um, and I don't see a definition of hourly wages in there um, and the surrounding paragraphs refer back to that middle paragraph so you it's a completely circular reference there. Am, am I missing something, or is it an erroneous reference, or what am I seeing here? Mr. Hartz. Chair Klein, uh, Senator Latz, you're correct. That is a drafting error. That should not be uh, paragraph A, clause 2. That should be uh, what, what happened here is this new language came in at 2 and 3. And so the original, it, it's, it's referencing what was originally um, and what is currently in law as uh, sub A2. So that should be um, A, I'm sorry, that should be A4, which is a reference to the calculation of the minimum wage. Mr. Chairman. Senator Lyons. Which Mr. Hartz then drops us down to what's now reproduced on line 15 of that page. Uh, Chair Klein, so yes, Hartz. that's correct, Senator Latz. Okay. Mr. Senator Latz. Um, uh, thank you for that clarification. Uh, and then if, if we go back to page 25, I had a question. There's a definition of employee, and, and I, I share Senator Rust's appreciation that, you know, the language is, is, you know, covers all the various definitions. But it always struck me as odd here and in other places that em for ease of drafting, it seems, the term employee is being defined as covering what we all think of as employees and a whole ton of other arrangements that aren't ever anywhere actually considered to be employees. But because we want whatever the substantive policy is to apply to people who are earning money, bringing in money, receiving money in payment for services, but aren't actually employees, we just all lump it into the employee definition because the term employee is used in other parts of the statute that are substantive. Um, so that might actually contribute to the confusion as to what's really an employee, what's not an employee. I don't know if there's an easier or better way to draft this, uh, but whoever is working on this drafting, it, someone's got to figure out, maybe Senate Council as a group can sit down and talk about how are we going to treat this so that when we say employee, we know it's an employee we're referring to, and not everyone that brings an in income from whatever source as a means of sustaining life on the planet. Um, and that's not really a, that's not a, that's not going after this bill in particular. It's a bigger question, but uh, it's in front of me right now, so I've identified it as a concern. Um, I guess I also have a question. Is there a fiscal note um, on this bill, or is, is uh, there not? Do we know? Senator Latz, it's requested. It's requested, but not available. Okay. So, it, Mr. Chairman, at this point, we don't know if this bill is going to be subject to the March 22nd deadline or the following uh, fiscal deadline, is that right? That is accurate. Senator Bolden. Uh, Mr. Chair, it's correct. We have requested one. I don't have it, but we do not expect this to have a cost. Senator Lass. But are waiting a, a fiscal note. Expecting, a, Mr. Chairman, Senator Bolden, expecting a zero fiscal note on it? Senator Bolden. That is correct. Mr. Senator Lass. Okay. All right, and I guess it, my question was already asked about what the path forward is uh, from here. Um, so I'll encourage the parties, stakeholders, to continue to work together um, to come up with uh, a broader agreement. It's a little bit broader than I thought was going to be coming to the committee based on representations that I had heard from a variety of sources. Uh, so I think it's, it's good that we're giving it this scrutiny. Um, and uh, encourage other committees that see this to give it similar scrutiny. It's a big bill with wide-ranging impact. Um, and uh, I would agree with Senator Frentz if at some point the scrutiny results in it coming back here for further review and scrutiny by the Commerce Committee, I would support that as well. Thanks. Thank yeah, you, Senator Latz, I guess I would agree with that. It, it's a big bill. I mean, it's got a lot of stops. And if it uh, you know turns out to have a fiscal note, then we would certainly want it to come back here and review that, or if there are other issues with the Department of Commerce, uh, we would like it to come back here as well. Um, any other member comments or questions? Senator Bolden, is it your understanding that this bill is going to be moved to the Committee on Health and Human Services? 
Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, it was my understanding that it would be moved to judiciary. We have a, a clone that's on its way to uh, Health and Human Services, but... Uh... Yeah, let me... Uh, I've just been advised of that same, that you have a clone bill authored by Dr. Uh, Senator Kupek that is in the committee of HHS, and that in an attempt to sort of expedite things, we've suggested that this would go to the Judiciary Committee. Let me ask uh, Senator Latz, uh, would you be comfortable moving this bill to the Judiciary Committee today in its current form? Uh, I would, Mr. Chairman, uh, with the caveat that we will only be looking at the judiciary-related provisions in there, and if there is any action requested to be taken on any other provisions, we'll move it back here for you. I think that's a reasonable uh, presumption, and I also think that, you know, continued work will be happening along this dual tract with the clones, so I appreciate the author's willingness to work aggressively and the Attorney General's willingness to work on those issues as well. So. Senator Dames. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, this bill then will come back to Commerce, is that correct? Uh, only if necessary, Senator Dames. I think there's a lot of work to do on this. I'm quite concerned about moving it out with, without, I, I think Commerce has a lot more to do in this bill, but I would sure like to see it come back if uh, we're not going to take care of it before we move it out. I think the bill needs to come back then. Noted. Further comments or questions on the bill? With that, the motion is by Senator Seeberger that Senate file 4065 as amended be recommended to pass and refer to the commissioner, commission, Committee on Judiciary. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. The bill is passed. Mm -hmm. Members, we had one other item on our agenda. I do not think we will have time for it today. We will try to take it up at a future meeting. Uh, the committee is adjourned.